Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. My name is Jaya Torres with Austin Waters Wildland Conservation Division. This series is a collaboration with Travis County Natural Resources, who co-manages the Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve with us. For today's presentation, we're happy to have the City of Austin's Danielle Gay. Danielle is a wildlife officer and her background is in wildlife biology and nature education. Danielle's work connects people with the natural world and fosters a deeper understanding and respect for our wild neighbors. Today's talk focuses on how Austin's growth impacts our natural resources and what you can do to protect our wildlife and reduce human wildlife conflict. After the presentation, Jeremy Hull, the volunteer coordinator at Travis County will manage the Q&A session. So feel free to put all questions in the Q&A box and not the chat. There will be a recording of the webinar posted on Facebook and our YouTube channel as well. And on that note, I'm gonna hand it over to Danielle. Alrighty, hi everyone, my name is Danielle Gay. Um, I wanna thank Travis County and the Wildlands folks for letting me talk to y'all today. Um, let me pull up my PowerPoint. Alrighty, so my talk is mostly going to focus on coyotes, um, but some of these practices um, also apply to wildlife, so I'll, I'll try to make that distinction um, when, I, when I think about it. So, like I said, my name is Danielle. I am a wildlife protection officer with the city of Austin, so I work with the animal protection or animal control unit, and we are housed out of the um, Austin Animal Center. My job looks very different from traditional Austin um, protection officers or animal control. You know, they mostly work with like pets and helping people you know, rehome and reunite with their, their furry friends. Um, my job is really just focused on wildlife. So we look a little bit different, but we all are housed under the same unit. All right, so I'm gonna dive right into coyotes with some myth busting. So um, first thing that I get a lot of questions about is, I saw an, a wild animal or coyote, you know, a possum, you name it, outside during the day that must mean it has rabies, right? That's not true. Our wildlife across Travis County, so if you're out in some of the rural parts of the county or if you're in the most urban parts of the city of Austin, it's not unusual to see a wild animal, particularly a coyote, out during the day. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that might happen, but just as a blanket rule, if you see a wild animal outside during the day, it does not mean that it has rabies. Coyotes also aren't looking, they're not out to hunt children and people. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about their diet and their natural history in a bit. Killing them doesn't always solve the problem. And national stats show that you're more likely to be bitten by a dog than really any wild animal, but particularly coyotes. So sometimes that fear of being attacked or being hunted um, or actively pursued by a coyote kind of raises this emotional level. Um, but statistics show that, you know, a loose dog on the street is more likely to bite you than a coyote. It's not likely that at least our coyote population in Austin's bringing with dogs. It doesn't really make sense for the biology. It has happened in the past, especially when you think of like wolves, dogs, and coyotes. There have been some interbreeding throughout their, their natural history, but at this point in time, there is such an abundance of coyotes, it's not really likely that they're breeding with dogs. And their howls that they make at night are distorted to make the pack sound a lot larger than they actually are. So it's another report or question that I get about, it's like, oh, I heard 30 coyotes in my backyard. Realistically, it's probably four to six, but the way that they uh, distort their howls with using some um, howling tones and some yipping tones, it just makes it sound larger. And that's an evolutionary uh, adaptation that they use to try to trick other coyote groups in the area that, hey, there's a lot of us here, you don't wanna move into our territory. So that's just some myths uh, that, and like common misconceptions that I get on the job. So let's talk about some of this coyote natural history or behavior. They are omnivores, so they eat a variety of plants and animals. They typically eat small animals, think, so, think of like rabbits, rodents. They will take some deer, especially fawns in the, um, the breeding season for them. Um, and on top of being omnivores, we consider them opportunistic omnivores. So that means that they already eat a variety of foods between plant and meat, but they will take almost anything that's at their disposal. And so that also means our food. So they may get into your garden and take some of your fruits or nuts. 
They may unfortunately eat some pets that are unattended or loose outside. Um, so we just consider them kind of like many other urban animals, you know, this opportunistic kind of like garbage disposal type animals. Um, they do live in small groups or packs. And I want to make the distinction that they're small groups compared to wolves. So that's another misconception is that there are packs of coyotes, you know, 20 or 30 running around the city. But typically it's just a small pack. Um, and I have a slide later that kind of shows their, uh, their hierarchy within their pack. They hunt solo. They, so again, unlike wolves, they don't hunt together. And the reason for this is because they particularly focus on small prey. It doesn't make sense for them to hunt in packs if they're only going after a squirrel or a rabbit or some rats. Um, so they typically hunt solo. And this allowed them to historically avoid competition with wolves, which also used to exist in this range. Um, so while wolves hunted in packs, they hunted for larger prey, coyotes focused on the smaller things, hunting alone, and that allowed them to kind of coexist in this area together. Now wolves aren't in Texas anymore, but rodents and small mammals are still a staple of the coyote diet. Their behavior can change. They're socially flexible, so they can function in packs or pairs or even be loners. And their behavior can change throughout the year depending on what's happening at that time. So for example, during the breeding season when they have pups in the den and a lot of mouths to feed, this might be the time that you start to see adults come out more so in the daytime than at night. And some of that is just because there are so many hours in the night that they need to make up for the time to be able to hunt and gather more food in the daytime. Typically though, they are active at dawn and dusk. And I will say that this changes depending on where you are within the county. So if you're out in more of the rural areas, it may be typical to see them somewhat during the day as well as at dawn and dusk or even at night. In the city, Studies have shown that coyotes that live closer to human developments tend to be more active at night to avoid any competition. But I will say the caveat to that is that our urban wildlife also has to adjust to finding resources at different times throughout the day. So that really just factors more into that. If you see an, an animal out during the day, it doesn't necessarily mean it's sick. It's most likely just adapting its own lifestyle to survive in the environment that it's in. Their average litter size is five to seven. They can have more, and I'll talk about that later. And then depending on how uh, resource rich their habitat is, so if they, are, if they have access to enough food and water and shelter, they may not move very far as far as their home range. If those resources are spread out a little bit more, then their home range can be a little bit bigger. But overall, the species is very adaptable, opportunistic, and intelligent. And that makes them cool as a, as a species in general but it also makes them a little bit challenging when you think about human wildlife conflict. Their size is about the size of a collie. Um, I like to compare them to a German Shepherd because of their overall look with their fluffiness and their upright ears. Um, but either way, they're about the size of a medium to large dog with their length and their height. So they stand about two feet tall and about four feet long. But the reality is that they're mostly bulk, all of that, or I'm sorry, mostly fluff, they're not bulk. All of that um, size appearance just comes from their shaggy coats. In reality, their size, as far as weight, is only about 25 to 35 pounds. Larger adults can get up to about 40, especially if you're in northern areas, think of like northern U.S. or even Canada, where it's a bit colder and they need to put on more coat. They can be a little bit heavier, um, but typically their size looks about you know, the size of a large dog, but weight is really small. And this picture here shows a coyote paw next to a woman's hand. So they're pretty small. Again, the reason for this is think about what they eat. They're hunting for small, fast prey. Doesn't make sense for them to be really muscular or bulky. Um, and this picture over here shows a coyote compared to a dog. So again, size might look similar, but when you're thinking about the composition of their body, Large dogs typically have a lot more muscle mass on them, whereas coyotes are thin, lanky, slender, lean, and fluffy. Um, and I like to just make this distinction because, especially if you see one from far away, if you're not used to seeing coyotes, um, that fear of, you know, the unknown of what this animal is like um, sometimes gives people the perception that they're really big and they're really strong and scary. 
All right, so coyotes have different seasons throughout the year where they're, they're doing different things. We're kind of at the end of the year now. They're getting, the adults are getting a little bit of a break, um, but they're gearing up for next year where they're gonna start rearing pups, finding mates. So um, coyotes mate for life. You typically in a pack have an alpha male and female. They, if they are not already established, come next year, just in a month, adults are gonna be looking to find a pair. And then in the spring, they're gonna be, or I'm sorry, or, uh, late winter, early spring, they're gonna be mating. Pups will be born in the spring and that's when denning season starts. And denning season pretty much lasts from early spring to midsummer. At this time, pups are gonna be growing. And again, this is where you might see parents being active, especially during the daytime, just trying to find those additional resources for their young. The pups will stay with mom and dad and in the den through most of the summer, and then they'll start coming out late summer. This is where they get their hands-on training with mom and dad. Um, you might see them, like in this picture down here, you might see them start to come out on their own and wander a bit. You'll see a lot of play during this time. And then around the fall, the juveniles will either stay with mom and dad for maybe another year or two, or they'll decide to move on. And um, this year has actually been slow with our reporting, but um, October through this, December is the time of year that we tend to get quite a bit reports about coyotes. And a lot of this is the juveniles, you know, it's their first time really out on their own. They're, you can think of them like teenagers. They tend to be a little more visible, maybe get themselves in a little more trouble as far as um, being out especially during the daytime or maybe just being a little tricky. Um, and this is typically when we get a lot of reports of, of coyotes. All right, so you might be wondering, you know, why are they here? What's the story behind that? So if anyone is a native Austinite, so are coyotes. All of Texas is contained in their native range. And as far as the way our city's built, we really provide them a lot of habitat and resources. So whether, again, whether you're in the county and some of the more rural areas, or if you're in urban spaces, we have lots of habitat fragments that connect our city and allow them movement corridors to, to get around. They also have lots of food. So rodents and squirrels and rabbits are very abundant in the city and that's the main source of their prey. They also eat lots of vegetation like juniper berries and fruits and nuts and when you think about some of our neighborhoods, we also give them a lot of our human food. We might have trash that's available, or like I said uh, previously, some of our pets. Um, but either way, we just make it, we, we make Austin and Travis County a really nice place for them to live. And they have few predators. So historically, wolves kind of kept them in check, but those are gone. And so really the only predators that coyotes currently have are disease or humans. And depending on where you live in Travis County, it may not be legal for you to take or kill coyotes. So uh, especially in places like Austin, they're really protected from a lot of predation. You may be seeing more now compared to in the past, and there may be a few reasons for that. One is just city growth. You know, as we increase um, housing development, as we grow throughout Travis County and the cities, we are destroying their habitat and those animals, coyotes and other wildlife need somewhere to go. And so they might just, you might be seeing them shift around trying to find new territories and homes. Another option might be the activity of your neighbors. So unfortunately we can't control everything outside of our home or even our yard. Um, and if you're having some type of wildlife issue, it could be the result of even someone down the street who may be is, is leaving out attractants for them. Mange is another consideration. We're seeing quite a bit of it in the city. Um, this alters their behavior. It's a disease. It alters their behavior a bit. I have a slide on it, so I'll, I'll talk about that more in a bit. And the history of how we've dealt with coyotes in the past has actually created more problems for us today. So this map shows the traditional range, historical range of coyotes that's in this dark gray here. As Western settlement expanded across the Western United States, wolves and coyotes and many other species were actively hunted. And that ultimately led to an extirpation or an eradication of wolves. And so when they were out of the picture, coyotes were able to move into those spaces that they once occupied. And so you can see 
um, on this with this graph on the left and then also with these arrows, you can kind of see the movement and the timeline that it took them uh, to move from this plains and prairie kind of southwest area to pretty much all of North America from Canada all the way down to Mexico. So they are here to stay. Um, and I just, before I move from the slide, I wanna make a note that, you know, the, the hunting and I would say over hunting and immense hunting pressure of wolves decimated that species. You know, we see today that their numbers are still very small across the U.S. And coyotes were also equally hunt, you know, the level of hunting pressure was equal for both wolves and coyotes. But the difference is that wolves are almost extinct in this country, whereas coyotes are not. It's a very different story for them. And part of that is because of their biology. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but before I do, I want to kind of explain more about why this over harvesting and over hunting didn't really work for them. So we know that they're all around. Um, we find them throughout the city. And then of course, the map I just showed you, they're really all over the US. So that makes it tricky for us to manage them. One, because they're so abundant, but two, we have legal limits, depending on where you are in Travis County, and then also these kind of biological limits for why moving or killing them won't work. So let's talk about moving first. You can't just move them, one, because they are a rabies vector species. So that means that they have a high likelihood of contracting and spreading rabies, so you actually cannot move coyotes outside of county limits. If um, This second point kind of goes towards all wildlife, but there is a common sentiment that, you know, you have an animal on your property and you don't really want them to be there anymore. You don't want to kill them. So you think that the next option would be to just move them, right? Just rehome them to another place. Well, that isn't going to be very successful for that animal. So the, this, like I said, goes for all wildlife, but particularly coyotes. You're moving them from a territory that they maybe established themselves or they were born into. They know that space very well. If you move them, you're moving them likely into another coyote's territory. So you're going to be, um, they're going to have a conflict with that coyote pack. They don't know where the, to find their food, their water. They don't know, you know, where maybe their escape routes are from, if there are any predators in that area, including the other coyote pack. So just think of if someone did that to you, right? If you're sitting in your living room and someone just scooped you up and put you in a completely other state, how do you think that, how do you think you would survive or how likely would it be that you'd be successful living in this new space without any type of planning or anything like that? And depending on the type of year, you know, if we're talking spring or summer and you move a coyote from one area to another, you might be leaving young behind and that can be really detrimental for them as well. So as nice as it might seem to just take this animal somewhere else so they can have a happy life elsewhere outside of your view. Um, that's not really the case for those individuals. And ultimately removing just the coyote or any wild animal doesn't always get to the root of the problem. And so you're likely to have either another coyote move in and create the same issue or some other wild animal depending on the situation. And so that leads into why we can't just outright kill them. So again, if you're not getting to the root of the problem, say you leave a plate of cat food out, you know, at night to feed your cats and a coyote comes by and eats it. Well, if you remove that coyote, but you keep the plate of food there, you're likely just going to have any animal really come up and start eating that. So that's what I mean by getting to the root of the problem. And so when we don't address the root of the problem, we remove an individual, it's just a temporary solution. It's not permanent. So it gives you this false sense of security of, well, if I just kill this coyote, maybe I won't have another issue for a few years. And that might be possible. Um, but this point down here that I want to make is that a lone coyote that's looking for a new area to establish can fill that void in as little as two to three weeks. So if you're not addressing that root problem, you're likely just going to continue to have issues with these wild animals. Traps of all kinds are illegal in the city. You have to have special permitting. Um, if you're in the county, it's not the same situation. Coyotes can be trapped and killed um, within outside of city limits within Travis County, as long as you're following state regulations. But 
I would advise against using traps mostly because they're indiscriminate. So when you set a trap, no matter what type it is, um, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get a coyote. So first off, coyotes are adaptable intelligent, like I mentioned before. We see that with live traps, they tend to just avoid them completely. And you're likely to get some other type of animal in there. So that could be your neighbor's cat, it could be an angry raccoon, it could be a stinky skunk, and then you have another problem on your hands. When we think of other traps like leg holds and neck snares, you again, how you run the risk of getting something that's not the targeted animal that you are trying to trap. And just last week, we had two instances with animal protection where a coyote was stuck in a leg hold and it was running around with that trap. Um, it fortunately got stuck under someone's car and animal protection was able to pick up that coyote and take it to the Austin Wildlife Rescue and it's actually recovering there right now. The other instance was actually someone's dog that got stuck with a leg trap on its, on its foot and again was running around the neighborhood and it took um, animal protection actually a few days to be able to locate this individual, um, approach it in a way that it wouldn't run because that was the issue when they would go up to it, it would just run away. And again, this, um, this dog's being treated currently. So again, you're allowed to within city limits to use these devices, but I would really um, encourage you not to just because of the negative implications for one, the, the species that you are trying to target, but also species that you're not trying to target. In, and again, including people's domestic pets. Now, Coyotes are, um, you know, I showed you with that map of their expansion, coyotes are actively being hunted pretty much all the time. We kill around 500,000 a year, it's about one per minute. And the reality is that it's not doing much to limit their populations. The reason behind that is because when you remove individuals from the pack, remember I told you there's an alpha male and female, and I have a slide in a minute that um, will show this a little bit more clearly. But when you remove individuals from the pack, it sets off a biologic response to make them overcompensate for these losses. And I just put this last bullet in here um, because I think sometimes when people have conversations with us, they might be calling 311 or animal control with the expectation that we will go out and remove the coyote for them. And when we explain that that's not the case, they kind of start to feel like, well, what is the point? Like, what are, what can be done then? And if there is an actual human safety threat, the city can respond to that individual. I will say though that the history of our coyote program and our 311 program, we have not had actual attacks on people. But if that gives you a little bit of peace of mind, the city can intervene and take lethal responses if we need to. All right, so this is that slide I keep talking about. This gives you a nice visual of how the hierarchy or the pack structure is laid out. So you have this alpha male and female. They're the only ones in the pack that breed. So each year they're gonna have some pups. And then the rest of the pack is made up typically of their family members, might be yearlings or older adults that have decided to stick around. And because only this male and female pair mate, they are regulating, self-regulating the number of individuals in their pack. But what happens, either, either through natural causes or through hunting, if one of them is taken out, another coyote is going to move in and they're, they're going to kind of reestablish that pack. When you get into a situation where you're removing multiple individuals, that's when you start setting off this biological response to overcompensate. So in this example here, we have you know, six individuals being taken out. This alpha... Um, well, um, coyote right here is going to start looking for a mate. There you go, here's the, the loner that's moved in. Because they ha have already seen such a loss in their, their numbers within their pack, this pair is going to ramp up their, um, their offspring litter size. So that's when we can get into those, you know, up to 16 in the litter. On top of that, these yearlings or older adults that have been hanging around are also going to find mates and do the exact same thing. And all of this is just to remake, uh, to, to make up for these losses. You know, they, they sense that their pack is being hunted and they want to make up for that. Now, thinking about this a little bit further, 
so, okay, so I would say when I first saw this concept, it didn't quite make sense to me. I'm like, okay, well, how can you possibly sustain all these litters of you know up to 16 pups? Well, part of that is right here, you've just removed six uh, individuals who are eating. So that's opened up quite a bit of resources in the um, you know immediate future as far as being able to feed everyone. It's not likely that all these pups will survive, right? But the point is that they're overcompensating. So they're trying to produce as many offspring as they can, hoping that some will survive and kind of restabilize the pack. And if you're over hunting quite a bit, you might even end up taking out, you know, several individuals from one territory and another territory. And it's possible that they might either merge or you're just opening a lot of resources that are available for these packs to survive. Um, this in, uh, this image is mostly focused for um, hunting of livestock, but I would say that pack disruption, you know, really causes an issue for anyone that lives closely with coyotes. So for Austin, if you're within city limits, we have a coyote management policy in place, and this has really been designed with coyote ecology and scientific studies, you know, as the basis for the policy. So it's, it's based on science, it's based on what we found to work and not work as far as coyote management. And because of, you know, this concept in particular, the city has really moved away from a lethal response method um, as, as part of their, it's not their first response, right? I said, if the city is having a human safety issue, lethal response is on the table, but it's not the first thing that we go to when we hear about human coyote conflict. So this Policy within, and again, I want to stress this, this is within city limits. So if you're in other parts of the county, you know, you can, as long as you're following state and federal regulation, you can kill and trap coyotes. Within city limits, it's completely illegal to kill or trap. Um, so we advise using tactics that alter the behavior of coyotes. I'll talk a little bit of that later. Um, and also promote some humane exclusion instead of outright killing and trapping. And the main goal of this is to educate and give residents more options. So when they call 311 or they talk to me, you know, I'm able to right away give them some peace of mind, give them some suggestions or answers to any questions that they have, and also give them options for the specific situation that they're dealing with. And so instead of just someone feeling like they need to go out and kill the coyote and hope that that takes care of it, you know, with this management policy, we're able to kind of work through some steps, identify what those root causes are, and then go from there as far as making an action plan. And again, we haven't had any human attacks, human attacks in Austin. Now, we do get quite a bit of pet attacks. And when I talk about a health and human safety issue, that literally just means humans. Are humans involved? Um, are humans' lives at risk or in danger? This can, I think it's not confusing, but it, it, there's a lot of emotion involved, right? When, um, when I get a call from someone that says that their pet was taken by a coyote, obviously that is very devastating for them. And that's something that we don't want to hear. But as far as is that particular instance one that warrants lethal response, the answer is no. Um, so by human attacks and using lethal response, we really only mean public and human safety. And I'll talk a lot about pets in just a bit. So the goal for our management policy is to maintain a balance between public safety and concerns that people have about coyotes living in the city or in the, the county, but also thinking about what is best for our wildlife and treating them humanely. And when we get any type of wildlife activity, especially with our coyote activity, we go through a response guide to see what the best management tools are, depending on the situation. All right, so what is it about our yards, our neighborhoods, or even the county or the city that really brings not just coyotes, but all wildlife in? And so a lot of what the, of the ways that we live really can attract or not attract wildlife. So this is just gives you a few examples of some things that might be attracting wildlife or coyotes to your yard or your neighborhood. So anything from unsecured trash and compost, if you're feeding wildlife or even pets. Um, so this picture right here has a bunch of plates of cat food that are left out. 
obviously that's going to attract anything um, to your yard. Pets themselves can be an attractant if they are alone in a backyard or a front yard and there aren't, you know, securities in place like a fence or a pen for them to safely be in, um, then they're likely to be taken by a coyote or any other wild animal. We get a lot of reports of feral cat colonies that unfortunately have been predated on by coyotes. Again, you have a concentration of pets, right? You have a concentration of cats, which coyotes see as prey. And then on top of that, if you're feeding your cat colony and leaving out food, then you're also providing a really easy meal for that coyote to come by and get some cat food and maybe even a cat. Um, this is, I think this is a little extreme, but if you have, you know, a dirty barbecue grill or if you just have like food scraps in your yard, of course that's going to attract them. They do eat a lot of fruits and nuts, so unfortunately we see sometimes that, you know, coyotes will be hanging out in someone's yard because they have a loquat tree and they would like to eat the fruit that falls on the ground. Um, brush piles may not hide a coyote, but they can hide things that coyotes like to eat. So rats, you know, maybe a possum or skunks living in this brush pile, and that can attract coyotes. And then any open structure. So I've gotten reports about abandoned houses that have coyotes living under them, maybe a shed um, or a balcony. Um, when we think of normal coyote behavior, it's not normal for them to go and live so closely to humans. So you know, it's not likely that they are going to live under your shed or your deck, but when we talk about injured or maybe sick coyotes, especially with mange, those open structures might be a good refuge for them. So what do you do about that? Well, you'll limit attractants. So you want to think about what's around your yard and remove any invitations that make your yard suitable for, for coyotes and all wildlife. There are a few tools that you can use. I have them on the next slide. So one's a coyote roller and another deterrent. Um, if you have really any pet, but particularly small pets, you want to keep them inside and supervise them while they're outside. So walk them on a leash, whether that be your dog or your cat, maybe you build them some type of enclosure to keep them safe so you don't have to supervise them, or you build a really sturdy tall fence in your yard. Another thing you can do is called hazing, uh, and I have some slides on that. That's just reinstilling their fear um, and I'll talk about that in, in a bit. If you want to report any wildlife activity, but particularly for coyotes, especially if they're sick, if they're injured, or if they're unresponsive to hazing, um, then you can call 311. And you want to tell your neighbors about all of this stuff, right? Like I mentioned that with especially the coyote management policy, we want to focus on education and spreading the word. And so telling your neighbors about all that you've learned today is going to also give them a suite of resources and tools and information that they can use. And I think it's important to remember that our behavior shapes coyote behavior. So our behavior as far as limiting attractants can shape their behavior um, because we're, we're no longer giving them these handouts in our yards or in our neighborhoods. So here's some of these deterrents. This is a coyote roller. Coyotes can jump about six or seven feet so it's really ideal if you have an eight foot or nine foot fence. I realize that's not um, possible for everyone. If you have a shorter fence, you can install a coyote roller. You can make them yourself. That's, uh, this is a homemade one out of PVC pipe. There's also a company that makes really nice ones that are made out of metal. And you would just install this on top of the fence. When the coyote goes to jump over, it hits this roller bar. It can't make it over the fence and instead falls back. Um, another popular deterrent is a motion activated sprinkler or lights. I would say sprinklers probably work better. And especially if you're having a coyote come around during the daytime, a motion activated light is essentially going to be useless. But with a sprinkler, as you can see with this rabbit, anything that walks past it is gonna get this hard jet of water sprayed at it. And over time, this might make the coyote or really any wildlife feel uncomfortable to go into the yard. If every time they enter the space, they just get sprayed with water. All right, so the thing with wildlife interactions in general and conflict is that every situation is different. And this is really where 311 can help um, no matter where you live within Travis County. So if you give 311 a call or you talk to one of our wildlife officers, um, we can go over with you about the particular situation that you're, you're dealing with, give you some tailored advice or information. And sometimes this can be as simple as, um, I have a possum in my, in my compost pile, like, 
it's noon. I'm worried that they're sick. What should I do? And I can have a really easy conversation with that person, let them know that that's normal. It's okay to see them out during the day. If you don't want that possum to be in your yard and you know, maybe consider putting that compost in a more secured uh, container and then problem solved. Or it can be, you know, I have a mange coyote that keeps coming into my yard and it's trying to get my cat, what do I do? Um, so this is really the meat of our job as far as providing resources and tailored solutions for any individual who calls 311. We can do that in a variety of ways. We can go out to your house, we can inspect your yard or your business, look for um, spaces that wild animals might be getting into. So if you have an opening under your deck, or if you have any type of attractant, so like I mentioned food or um, unsecured trash, anything like that, we can come to your home and we can um, do this yard or site visit, yard audit or site visit and just kind of tell you like, hey, these are some of the things that I've noticed that might be resulting in this wildlife conflict that you're having. We can use um, game cameras to monitor the activity that's happening in your yard. And this is particularly important for anyone who's interested in doing humane exclusion. So maybe we set up deterrence, maybe we block access to that area that they're getting into. And then we install these cameras to see, are they still coming by? Um, are these humane exclusion tactics working? Uh, and then we can ultimately see when that species has left. Um, I can also help with species identification. So sometimes coyotes and foxes get confused. People might not understand. Um, they think they're looking at a coyote, but they're really looking at a fox. So just going through some species identification sometimes help. And then also recommendations for pet and livestock safety. And when we say, so the goal of the city management policy, but also just our jobs as wildlife officers is to promote coexistence with all wildlife, but particularly coyotes. But when we say coexistence, we're not letting, we're not saying like, oh, just let them do whatever they want in your yard or in your neighborhood. And I have two examples here, I think that explain this very clearly. So um, in this particular situation, this coyote is just hanging out, maybe looking for food. This person's walking their dog. Uh, and they're just ignoring this behavior. This is sending a message to this coyote that I can come out in the middle of the day, I can hang out in someone's yard and people will walk past me and nothing bad will happen to me. And ultimately you're shaping the behavior of this coyote to continue to, to do this activity. Um, this situation, this person is trying to take a photo of this coyote, they're very close to that coyote, that's a perfect photo opportunity for them. But again, you're sending this message that I can approach humans and nothing bad will happen to me. And so for us, we like to use this tagline of we wanna share space, right? Coyotes live and wildlife, they live in the same spaces that we do, but we don't necessarily wanna share time with them. We wanna encourage, especially in the city, we wanna encourage coyotes to be coming out more in the nighttime to avoid us. And we don't want to enable them to, um, be in situations where they're coming into close contact with humans. And so one of the ways we can shape this behavior is through hazing. So in both of these situations, it would be really great if these people hazed these coyotes to send that message of, hey, you're not really welcome here. Now, hazing is just a fancy way to say scare coyotes. You can do it in a lot of different ways. And the whole goal is to be scary and unpredictable to reshape their fear and their wariness of humans and to encourage them to avoid contact with us. So while you're hazing, I would say the most important thing to do is to maintain eye contact. You want that coyote to know that the scary behavior is coming from you. Um, you can wave your arms, you can shout, you can throw objects towards them, just make sure they're not food. Um, you can spray them with a hose, really anything that's listed on here. If hazing, um, while you're hazing, it needs to be done thoroughly also, it needs to be exaggerated. So you might feel really silly, like waving your arms and shouting, um, but you want it to be exaggerated. You want it to be assertive. You want it to be thorough. So you want to haze that individual until it's completely out of your sight. I've heard um, lots of uh, reports actually of people, you know, they say, oh, I shouted at it and it ran towards, you know, the yard, but then it just stopped and looked at me. Well, if you stop the hazing at that point, say you went inside your house, you're just teaching that coyote that it just needs to wait until you're done doing your weird, scary, unpredictable, you know, shouting or, or, you know, waving. And then 
you'll go inside and it can continue to stay in your yard. You need to haze that coyote, even if it stops and stares at you, you know, maybe ramp up your efforts a bit and make sure that you're hazing until it is completely gone, just so that it knows that you're being serious and be persistent with it. So every time the coyote comes into your yard, go out and you haze it thoroughly until it's completely gone. And again, it might, it might take more than one time, but if you think about for you, say you went to the grocery store and every time you went to the grocery store, someone weird came up and, you know, started waving their arms and shouting at you, you might start shopping at a different grocery store if that happened every single time you were there. That's kind of the goal that we're, we're trying to, you know, work with this particular individual. Every time they come into your yard, you're coming by and you're being really scary and waving your arms and screaming at them. They're probably not going to keep coming back. So it might take a few times. Um, switching up your hazing tactics is a good idea. So if you just go out there and wave your arms and shout, hey, go away, every time you see it, that might not be scary enough. So the next time you see it, you might want to kind of lunge at it or you might want to throw something at it. The whole point is to be unpredictable. Um, hazing is best when it can come from more than one person. So say, you know, an entire neighborhood is having an issue with a particular coyote. Encourage your neighbors um, to also go out and haze the individual. Don't just, um, don't make that responsibility yours alone. And hazing essentially is the best solution for, for coyotes, um, right? It reshapes their behavior, makes them alter the way that they're using our landscape, and then it, it helps to keep our pets and us safe too. All right, so we're running short on time. So I have some examples here of way of, I'm sorry, examples where you can decide if you should haze or not haze. So I'm gonna go through these really quickly. So this coyote is out during the day, just kind of hanging out in the street. This is definitely an ind individual that you would wanna haze. This one's lounging around in a yard. So again, haze. Uh, with this particular coyote, I, I was thinking that, you know, this is, maybe like a natural space or a city park. Um, this coyote is out during the day, but because it's in its natural habitat, we're gonna encourage you to not haze this individual. So we don't wanna send the wrong message. We wanna haze when coyotes are entering our spaces, our yards, you know, our neighborhoods. But if we're in their home, say the Greenbelt or any type of park, we wanna just leave them alone. That's where they live. So don't haze this one. If you see a young coyote, um, a pup, you do not want to haze that individual. They're not going to understand what's happening and it's likely that mom or dad are going to be around and then you're putting yourself and them at risk of any contact. So don't haze young. Don't haze animals when they are out at night. So this is the time that we want them to be outside. You know, they're on the streets, they're eating whatever meal that they've just caught. Um, but if you came out, so this is three in the morning, if you came out three in the morning, started shouting and waving at them, they might think that they need to start coming out at 3 p.m. And that's definitely not the case. So coyotes at night, you leave them alone as long as they're not um, posing any risks to you or your pet. Don't haze them. We also don't want to haze any individuals that are too far away. So if you see a coyote and it's just, you know, all the way down the street, by the time you run after it, it's probably just going to run away and that's just a waste of your time. You don't want to haze any coyote that's cornered, um, so that's going to make them most likely react in a way that they are going to protect themselves, right? So, um, and that puts you and the coyote at risk of an interaction. So don't haze any animal that's cornered. The best thing to do is just to walk away. And then again, don't haze any coyote that has pups around because you're going to also make this individual feel like it needs to protect itself and it's young. We also say not to um, haze coyotes that are sick or injured. And again, that's just, it's especially if they can't run away, um, they're gonna want to defend themselves and that's just not very humane to, to be has, uh, hassling you know, a sick or injured animal. The best thing to do in that situation would be to call 311. Now I will say there's an exception for mange. And this picture here shows a mange coyote. Um, I have a slide on mange just after this. This coyote is one moving, right? We can see that it's walking around. I would say in this particular instance, you want to haze. This animal is, you know, being afflicted with a disease. It's looking for easy food and water and maybe shelter. But the fact that it's able to get around pretty easily, you 
you want to haze this individual to encourage it to move on. If it is so sick that it can no longer move, then that falls under this, this category of just go ahead and call 311. All right, so mange is uh, caused by a mite that burrows under their skin. It causes hair loss and secondary infections because they're, they're doing a lot of scratching and opening wounds on their skin. Um, and especially in places that are a lot colder than Texas or if we keep having you know, winter storms, um, that loss of fur really exposes them to the elements and, and they can ultimately succumb to death that way. Treatment is near impossible. We don't have any mange task force in Travis County or in the city. Um, and the treatment for it really just hasn't been studied very much. Um, and so ultimately there's just not much that we can do. We um, believe that mange was originally introduced by humans. So during westward settlement, when hunters were trying to eradicate wolves and coyotes, they purposely inoculated um, individuals with this mange, hoping that it would wipe out the population. And it hasn't. And so it's because it's so prevalent, it's historically you know, been around for quite some time. We just consider mange a natural part of the ecosystem. So it's just a disease like you know, any other distemper or rabies, you know, sometimes we can try to control it, but most of the time it's just a natural part of the ecosystem. It's not always a death sentence. So like I mentioned, if Texas stays warm throughout the year, it might take a while, maybe even years for an individual to shake their mange infection, um, but it is, it is possible that they can. Mange coyotes can be a huge problem, and this is because of the behavior alteration that happens with mange. So if you think about it, I imagine that coyotes with mange are incredibly uncomfortable. They probably don't get a lot of sleep, um, and it just, it changes their behavior so that they are no longer actively pursuing their natural prey or doing their normal coyote activities. They tend to move further into our neighborhoods, and especially our yards, they're really just looking for easy food or easy places to, to rest. Um, and this is when we especially see problems with coyotes taking pets. The best thing to do as far as um, a, a coyote with mange is really just to leave them alone. You again, wanna remove any attractants that encourage them to come to your yard. And if they are becoming an issue, you wanna haze them. All right, so I'm gonna uh, just have a few slides left and really quickly just go over pet safety because a lot of the interactions that we see within the county and the city is that coyotes are coming into contact with people's pets in a variety of ways. Um, and ultimately the safety of someone's pet is the responsibility of the owner. So in this particular situation, this is kind of one of our game cameras and we've heard that this dog is fine. But in this particular situation, this dog was outside alone for whatever reason. And this coyote thought that that was a great opportunity to get a meal. And we don't want, we really just don't want this situation. And the best way to avoid this is for owners to take responsibility of their pet and do things that make sure that they stay safe. So one encounter that you might uh, come across is called flushing. This typically happens during the denning season. And essentially you and your dog have come too close to the coyote's den and it feels threatened. And this might be a situation where it comes out and tries to approach you and your dog. The best thing to do in this situation is just to walk away. It's really scary for the person because they think that they're being followed by this coyote, but really the coyote's focusing on the dog. They see them as a threat to their den and their pups, and they just want them out of that area. Um, if this happens to you, definitely report this to 311, um, especially if you have any questions. We, we like to know when flushing behavior is happening and keep dogs on leash in designated areas. We do have some off leash areas, you know, across Austin and Travis County. Um, and you may encounter a situation like this where you're, if your dog is off leash, they might try to um, chase the coyote or the coyote might chase your dog. And then you have an issue where your dog may be lost or you have to go get them. Um, so especially if you're in an on leash area, we really appreciate you following city and county um, leash laws and keeping your pet right next to you, it will avoid any type of uncomfortable encounter. All right, so again, keep your pets on a leash when you're outside. That um, keeps them safe and it gives you peace of mind because they're right there and they're under your control. The shorter the leash, the better. Um, our, our city law says at least a six foot, or I'm sorry, at most a six foot, um, but you can do you know, anything shorter if you like. We say to avoid extendable leashes, mostly because, you know, if your dog is on an extendable leash and it's 10 or 20 feet away from you, one, 
if there is an encounter, you're not able to grab or move your animal close to you. Um, and also the extendable leashes, you know, they're so thin, it's not always apparent that your dog is on leash. And we think that this is the same case for, for coyotes. You know, if they're really far ahead and there's just this almost invisible line that's connecting them to you, they might not realize that that's a leash and they might try to take that opportunity to, to take the pet. Keeping your doors, this is, you know, a bit of a repeat, but we really like to stress that pets, especially small dogs and cats, really should stay inside or be monitored outside to protect them from all kinds of um, issues, especially coyotes. Don't let your pets explore dense vegetation. So if you're in a park, you know, I actually used to have a habit of letting my dog do this and he's found quite a few like, snakes. So don't let your pets, um, don't let them off leash and let them run through dense vegetation. When you're on the trail, you know, try to keep them from sniffing stuff where you really can't see what's in there. Feed your pets inside. And if you, um, you know, if you just, if that's just your routine that you feed your pet outside, you don't wanna change that, you can, alter the ways that you do that. So maybe feed them at a specific time or um, you know, only feed in the daytime. And when they're done, just take that food inside. Don't leave it out all the time for anything to get access to. And don't let your cats roam the neighborhood. You know, they have, um, I actually have this slide here. Cats face a lot of stuff when they're left outside. They could be hit by a car, they could get lost or stolen. They could be attacked by a variety of animals, get diseases, you name it. Um, so we really like to encourage people build a catio or an enclosure for your cat or even your dog, you know, if they want to enjoy that time outside, giving them some type of secured area that they can stay in, right? They won't, you won't run the risk of them getting out and you won't run the risk of anything coming in and um, harming them. All right, so overall, just we want to uh, limit attractants. We don't want to make it, we don't want to make a habitable, habitable place for wildlife or coyotes. We want to give them consequences if they're coming into our spaces. We want to make sure that we're employing our best pet safety practices to keep our pets safe. And then of course, educate um, your friends and family and let them know what you've learned today. Now I wanna stress on this last slide that if you are someone that appreciates having wildlife in your yard, you know that's okay too. I don't want to send the message that if you have a possum in your yard, you have to get rid of it. We really focus on you know, the limiting attractants and shaping your behavior to shape coyote behavior or wildlife behavior um, in the instances where it's becoming a problem. If you're interested in building a habitat that is suitable for wildlife without giving them handouts, right? Without giving them open feeding, without, um, without encouraging those bad behaviors that we don't wanna see, we can also help out with that too. So I have my contact information here. And Emery Sadkin is our county officer. So if you have any issues, um, you can call 311 or this is the, uh, the main line. If you, if some, 311 doesn't work in all areas throughout the county. So this is our main line as well. Um, and you can talk to one of us about your issues and hopefully we can help you out. Awesome, thank you so much, Danielle. There was so much great information there. Um, I just want to say to everybody, we've got, uh, Jaya's posted some links in the chat if you want to learn more about the BCP and the maps around our area, so you can check that out. And then we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to as many of them as we can, and um, we'll go from there. So the first one, we had several questions, and I want to, you just hit it on your last slide quite a bit, but I wanted you to reinforce that knowledge of, you said, I know you're with the city, but who do we call if we're in Northwest Travis County? What about Round Rock? What about Williamson County? We have just a huge list of, you know, what about me? Yeah, so I would say um, if you're in within Travis County, 311 it, or the, the main line is the one to call. Like for Williamson County, unfortunately, um, you know, our resources don't extend very far. I would say if you're having an issue though, I would contact um, someone with TPWD. They, they might have more resources for you. Perfect. All right, next, uh, first question we had was, you mentioned coyotes take advantage of small pets. What's the likelihood of larger pets? We're talking dogs 50 pounds or greater. Yeah, so I would say with larger pets, especially dogs, coyotes can see them as a threat, right? They, um, as, and, you know, I kind of explained that with the flushing behavior. They're not seen as food, but they might be seen as competition for their, within their pack or their young. Awesome. 
Um, I thought this question was really interesting. Are there certain areas in Austin or Travis County where coyote populations are higher and they require more attention from you guys? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. Um, we don't have, so as far as getting like a population estimate, we'd really need to be able to track individuals. So that would be like putting some type of GPS collars on them or doing some genetic analysis um, to discern individuals. And we're unfortunately not doing any of that work. It would be really great to give you a population number. I will say though that um, we can see kind of hot spots based on the 311 reports that we get. And really they, they alter by month or even by year. Um, so back in like October, I was getting a lot of reports from Southwest Austin, as far as mange coyotes particularly. Um, I don't have a lot of data on the, the county calls, Emory would have that, but um, it really just varies. But we see, I mean, I would say that there isn't a space within Travis County that we have not gotten some type of report from. Um, but as far as you know, places that need a little bit more attention, that can really change depending on the season or the year. Excellent. The next one popped up when you were talking about population sizes and the, the numbers that are killed um, every year. Is it a concern that coyotes can overpopulate an area as the deer do in our area? And it's um, then he followed up with, does their intelligence not overcompensate for them being killed? And then he said, it seemed like killing 500,000 a year seems like a very large population and it's still growing, question mark? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the problem that we've created for ourselves, right? So, you know, they used to be um, contained in the South and Midwest and then killing them, you know, caused them to kind of over, over, overcompensate. The extirpation of wolves allowed them to move. And so we really have created this issue for ourselves where coyotes are very abundant. I will say that keeping um, keeping pack stabilization is good as far as controlling the population. And then also, you know, just this is unfortunately really where the human aspect comes in, where we need to deal with altering human behavior to alter the coyote behavior. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the killing that, that was done historically and even today, you know, really just continues to create this issue for us. And I will say it wasn't in my slide, but coyotes, I think, if, I think the number that I read was like, they've expanded their range by 40%, which is more than any other large carnivore in the US or in North America. So um, yeah, they're, I, I like to call them rats. <laughs> just the way that, you know, they, they or bunnies, like they just, they have the ability to reproduce like crazy or even deer, you know, they just, the difference is that they're a large carnivore and that comes with a different set of challenges. Yeah, they're very good at what they do. Yes. I like them a lot. Um, so the next one came up, and, and I think you covered this pretty well, but let you reiterate it a little bit. Um, if you so, if you live in the city of Austin and a coyote is actively attacking your pet in your backyard, your fenced backyard, you can't kill it. Right. So I would say in that situation, calling three one one is the best option. Um, typically, the reports I've gotten when pets are being attacked, you know, it happens so fast. I would, I would say that it's not very likely that you would be able to kill that coyote in that situation. And I also want to stress that um, within city limits, you are not allowed to discharge a firearm. So we get this question a lot like, oh, can I just go in the street and shoot it? No, you absolutely cannot. And, you know, the main reason behind that is because you don't know where that bullet's going to go. Um, I would say that if your pet is actively being attacked by a coyote, trying to scare it off, I mean, you could, you could, if you had like a stick or something, you can definitely try to do that um, as far as, you know, stopping that encounter. But it is illegal within the city to intently try to kill a coyote in, in any particular way. Um, so yeah, and, and that's another reason why we stress that, you know, pet safety is, is preventable, or not safe, pet safety is preventable, but it's the, responsible, the responsibility of the owner, and then that particular encounter may be preventable based on the safety measures that you put in place to keep your pets safe. Um, so we really wanna encourage um, pet owners to be proactive as far as their pet safety instead of reactive. Excellent, thank you very much. And we still have some questions in there, but we're right against that hour, and in respect of everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and stop there.
But y'all, I just want to thank you. This was an excellent presentation. Um, it will be recorded and shared on our websites for future. It will be an amazing reference uh, for folks going forward. So thank you very much for joining us.